To really appreciate the story of Joan Glancy, you have to know what Duluth was like back 70 years ago. At that time, there was only one paved road, and that was Buford Highway and Main Street. In 1930, there were 608 people in Duluth. In 1940, 10 years later, there were 626 people in Duluth. So it grew by 18 people in 10 years. Duluth was uh, still in the throes of the Depression when the story of Joan Glancy started, as was most of the South. Dick Hall was the owner of Irvindale Dairies in Atlanta, and he had a very successful dairy farm. But he decided that he wanted a model dairy set up to show his rich friends where his the milk came from and so thank goodness he found land in in Duluth that he wanted to build this model dairy on and so he built Irvingdale Farms which is uh, oh about a, a mile and a half from the middle of the middle of Duluth and it was the most fantastic thing the farmers around here had ever seen one thing they had never seen automatic milking machines. And so this was really a tourist attraction for a while because people went to, to see this wonderful thing. And one Sunday morning, uh, Henry Burnett, which was one of his milkers, came uh, to the, and knocked on the door. In fact, it was uh, Christmas Eve in 1940. And he asked uh, Dick Hull if he said that he would like for him to take him up to Duluth to uh, get some clothes to bury his little boy in. And so Dick Hull said, what in the world, what happened? And he said, well, that he had died the night before. And he said, well, what did the doctor say? What happened? And, and he said, well, we didn't have a doctor. And from that, Dick Hull found out that there were no medical facilities in Duluth. And so he took, the, he took him up to Duluth to, to, and got my parents to open their, the store. And, uh, while he was, they were looking about buying the clothes, Dick Hull uh, talked to my mother and was horrified when he found out that there was really no medical facilities here. And so in the process of talking, he finally said, could you get the people together to, uh, I'd like to talk to them. The following week, uh, they had a meeting at the schoolhouse and the people came together and met with uh, Dick Hull. And he talked to them and told them how that he couldn't believe that there were no medical facilities in Duluth. And so he asked the people there if they were interested and if they would help him if he tried to change this. And everyone there was, was very enthused about it, very interested. But as I said, this was during the, really still the Depression, and people had very little money. You better look around, Mr. Hull. No rich people in this room. What you're talking about takes an awful lot of money. He, told my mother and the others that if they would find a place that he would help them start a little uh, clinic. And at that time there was a, a wooden house right on the corner of the schoolyard that the janitor lived in. And so the school said that they could use that house for the clinic if they'd find a place for the janitor. And they did. And so uh, then the people in Duluth got together and remodeled that house. And the one thing that Dick Hull had insisted on, though, was that there be equal facilities for the black and for the white. And so the, the black community and the white community came together and they worked and completely redid that house. From the very beginning, it was very successful. I mean, the people came from everywhere because there were, at that time, there were no medical facilities in all of Gwinnett County, not just in Duluth. But of course, they, but there were so many things they needed. And in the process, uh, Dick Hull had told his father-in-law, who was uh, General A.R. Glancy, he was uh, Vice President of General Motors in Detroit, and he was also a four-star general. But he had told him about what the people in Duluth were trying to do and about the little boy dying. And uh, General and Ms. Glancy had lost 
their daughter, Joan, uh, 20 years before that, but when they were on vacation in Bermuda and it couldn't, didn't have any medical facilities. And so General Glancy sent a check for $500 and said that uh, he'd like to do that in memory of his daughter, Joan. Mr. Hurd Summerar, who was this wonderful Mr. Duluth, wonderful man then, he wrote him back and told him how much we appreciated it. And uh, so then he said that we would love to, to name the hospital after Joan. General Glantz, he wrote back and he was thrilled and uh, he was uh, going to come down to see this hospital that would have his daughter's name on it. Our store was right across the road from, from John Glancy then, so they, everybody met there. And then when the general came, they all walked over together to the clinic. And so they said, well, well, what do you think? And he said, well, where is it? And they said, well, here. And he said, you mean that's what my daughter's going to have her name on? And he was not thrilled at all. And so he said, uh, Miss Kate, he said, I heard about the meeting at the schoolhouse. Well, we've got to have another one. And so then they had another meeting at the schoolhouse, and the people of Duluth met together with General Glancy. And he told them that if they would, uh, that he really admired what they were trying to do, but that he didn't think it was enough. And if they would buy the land and dig a well on it and shape up the land, that he would build them the finest little hospital in the country. And so the people in Duluth were thrilled. And they bought 24 acres of land, and they dug a well on it and, and cleared it and turned it over to General Glancy. Well, it was coming along, except that General Glancy, as I told you, he was uh, vice president of General Motors. He had actually was the one, he was head of the Pontiac division. He was actually the one that gave the Pontiac car its name. And he was one of the ones that instituted the assembly line. So you can imagine what he thought of this Southern labor that didn't show up on Monday mornings and moved too slow for him. And so he kept, he was very upset about how slow it was moving and all and, and kept complaining. And then one day he came into the store and told my mother, he said, I will pay for what's been done already, but I'm through. If they, if the, if they don't care any more than to even show up for work, I wash my hands of the whole affair. And he left. And so you can imagine how, how the people in Duluth felt, I mean, how my mother felt when, the, when he told them that because they had no money to finish this hospital. And at that time, there was this wonderful black lady named Miss Mamie Howell. And she had been right in the middle of everything. And she came in the store after she heard that and said, Miss Kate, I th I've got a plan that I'd like to try. And so uh, my mother said, Mamie, we'll try it. And so that Sunday afternoon, when uh, General Glancy was visiting with the Hulls at Irvingdale, and uh, Mamie and her people, and then a, a, my mother and father and a lot of the people from the white community too, all walked down to Irvingdale singing uh, Negro spirituals. And then they stood in front of the house uh, singing until uh, <clears throat> General Glancy and the Hulls came out. And then Mamie stepped forward and she said, made, my mother said, made the most beautiful speech she had ever heard. And she said, uh, General, she said, uh, you have done so much for everyone, but, but you have not left my people out. And there's no telling how many babies that you have already saved. And she said, General, you may have stars on your shoulders now, but you'll have stars in your crown when you meet your maker. And my mother said that then the general just turned his back. And she thought, oh no, what now? And then he turned back around and tears were streaming down his cheeks. And he said, Mamie, you're gonna have your hospital. One thing that General Glancy had, had wanted to do was to uh, get donations from his rich friends up north. And then he, he actually worked and got well, for instance, the Ford Foundation gave $10,000 to the hospital. And then another company furnished all the steel for the hospital. And so fundraising was a big part of it even then. July of 1944 was the biggest day that had ever been in Duluth because that was the dedication of Joan Glancy Memorial Hospital. 
the little girl, the baby that was born first in the new hospital, they named her, the parents were smart, and they named her Glancy. Her name was Glancy Jones. And General Glancy completely paid for her education and for all her clothes and for everything all the way through college. And actually she became a nurse, which was a very fitting. All of the children that had been born there were invited to this, uh, to Joan Glancy Day. And this is something that was kept up as long as the general was alive. Uh, in July, every year, they had Joan Glancy Day, and all of the babies were invi invited back. And in fact, uh, well, in 1957, uh, 5,000 babies had been born at Joan Glancy Hospital. But this was at a time when there was very little money and that most people did not have insurance. And so uh, the money, the hospital immediately began losing money. And so uh, General Glancy came to my mother again. He said, Miss Kate, we gotta have another meeting at the schoolhouse. And so they met at the schoolhouse again. He was going to build a factory to support the hospital. And he said the name of it was gonna be GKW. And so they said, what does that mean? And he said, well, that when he and Miss Glancy were first married, that they had very little money, and she kept the budget. And he looked at it, and it said clothes, rent, food, all this. And the last, the last column was GKW. And he said, he asked her what in the world that was. And she said, that's goodness knows what. And he said, goodness knows what we will make in this factory, but it will be something. And, the, and so... Uh, Anyway, so the, the, he built a $500,000 factory to keep up a hospi the hospital, which was much, cost only $120,000 originally. And in this factory, they started out making polishing buffing cloths for, for cars and then nylon seat covers for cars, but finally ended up making men's shirts and then changed to uh, men's jackets. One reason that Joan Glancy was so successful, it wasn't just General Glancy and Dick Hall, it was Dr. Mason. The first really main doctor that we had at Joan Glancy was Miles Mason. And his son is, a, is one of our leading doctors even today, but Dr. Mason carried that hospital and he delivered more babies than anybody I've ever heard of. Later on, Dr. Mason had his uh, college roommate to join him in Duluth to practice medicine. And Dr. George Tootle was a legend in himself, just like Dr. Mason was. Some way, a uh, Saturday Evening Post found out about this story of Joan Glancy Hospital. And so they came to Duluth. In fact, uh, a reporter from the Saturday Evening Post spent two weeks in Duluth uh, learning all about it and gathering information. And then in 19, uh, 1950, uh, a wonderful article came out in the Saturday Evening Post. And the only thing that the people in Duluth were upset about, I guess you would say, is the title for it. The title was Medical Miracle in the Backwoods. And of course, we didn't even know we were in the backwoods. But actually, that was, and the article was just wonderful. Well, from that article, then there was a primetime TV show, DuPont's Cavalcade of America. And so they came and filmed in Duluth. And the only thing that people in Duluth were really surprised at, at that was the terrible accents they gave all of us. You suppose Miss Lilith, they're accusing me of scooting off to Atlanta, drumming up stamp business just to raise my salary? But of course, we, don't, we didn't think we sounded like that, but of course we do. And then in 1957, they added a $400,000 uh, addition onto the hospital. In 1955, the Gwinnett Hospital Authority was established. And so then in 1959, they opened Button Gwinnett Hospital. Then in 1966, under the Gwinnett Hospital Authority, Buford General Hospital was opened. Before that, Hutchins Memorial Hospital had been in Buford. Joan Glancy had been an independent hospital all these years, but in 1966, Joan Glancy joined the Gwinnett Hospital System. 
And then in 1972, they put a, another large addition on it. But then in uh, 1982, they started talking about a new hospital for the county, a new hospital in Lawrenceville, and started working on that. And at that time, uh, they decided that uh, John Glancy had been so successful in, uh, in OB and had thousands of babies had been delivered. But they decided that with the new hospital coming that that needed to be moved to Lawrenceville. Well, you can imagine how the people in Duluth took that. And so they were not happy at all that this, this important category would be moved to Lawrenceville. And uh, in fact, there was, they had banners made that over all the streets, over all the roads that said, Save Joan Glancy. But it worked out and, uh, and eventually people understood that this was really going to be the best way for the hospital system to evolve. And so in, in 1984, Winnett uh, Medical Center in Lawrenceville was opened. I came on the hospital board in 1990, and we, right after that, we opened the women's pavilion. And then to me, the most exciting thing that ever happened, though, was in uh, 2006 when we opened Gwinnett Medical Center in Duluth. And then we did the tower in 2009, and now the Strickland Heart Center is well on its way. And so the whole system has been just wonderful and has grown so much. The hospital foundation was started in 1990, and it has been a wonderful addition. And I think that uh, the beginning of philanthropy, though, was with John Glancy Hospital back in when, when John Glancy was first built. The dedication on uh, John Glancy that uh, Mr. Hurd wrote and is still outside the John Glancy Hospital is really is the feeling for our whole hospital system. It says that to Joan, who in swift transition achieved eternal springtime, this hospital is dedicated in the hopes that through it, the lives of other children may be enriched. And of course, I would say that it is not just the children that their lives have been enriched by this. It's everyone. And our hospital system, I think, has lived up to everything that John Glancy ever promised.